<clears throat> Calvinism theological quicksand. Uh, we know what quicksand is. Where's that flicker at? I don't have it. That little thing? Hey, okay. I try to go to my first slide and it's not, it's like total inability, you know. <laughs> Thank you. What's that? <laughs> I am in quicksand. Uh, or sliding shale, one or the other. Probably a lot of similarities there that I hadn't thought about. <clears throat> uh, when you're in quicksand, of course, I heard about quick, quicksand when I was a, just a youngster. And I determined that that's something that I didn't want any part of because I don't care to die that way. And uh, if we have a, a system of theology that is easy to get into and hard to get out of, we have a real problem in the church. And the problem is that the, the Calvinist idea is, has permeated Christianity, Western Christianity at least, uh, to the extent that what, what percentage, it would be a huge percentage of people are affected by these ideas. I have people who have brains galore that I know, and they just, it just doesn't click that there's a contradiction in their message. They have slid into the theological quicksand. I want you to watch this movie. Quicksand doesn't really kill you. Quicksand holds you there until the sun kills you. You can't get out and you die if you're alone and have no help. It doesn't always just suck you under. As a matter of fact, I think the the person who gives this little slide, you'll probably recognize him, but I want to show you this video. Tiny desert springs bubble to the surface, but don't be fooled. This could be lethal quicksand, which has been known to swallow vehicles and people whole. Fall into this and you'd be in big trouble. I'm going to show you how to get out of it alive. And what's nasty about this stuff is the more you fight it, the more it like pulls you in. And let you suddenly realize it's not just this crust of sand that you thought, but actually it's all of that clay and water. And each time you pull it, try and pull your leg up, the suction just pulls it back in. That's why these things are so dangerous. And the reason these can actually kill people is not because they swallow you, it's because they just don't let you out of it. And the killer is that, the sun. Okay, I want to be trying to get out of this place now. Quicksand is twice as dense as your body, so in theory it should be impossible to drown. But if you panic, you just get sucked in further and you won't have a hope of getting out. <coughs> That's really tempting just to reach out and grab a hand. But actually, in many ways, that's the last thing you want to do. It's dangerous. You then pull somebody else into the same situation you're in. Or you could dislocate your shoulder. But getting out of here is a battle. Only last year, two young teenagers were out looking for food on the bottom of a muddy lake. And both died in quicksand. So the way to get out of this is to try and pull your legs up towards the surface. But really, the number one rule is keep calm. Don't fight it. You know, the more you fight this thing, the more it's going to pull you in. So just try and control your breathing and try and maneuver your chest onto the surface. Uh, try and get a leg out. Uh, and then just monkey crawl your way out. <laughs> Feels like I've got lead boots on. First thing you've got to do is get these muddy clothes off. If you try walking far like this, 
You're just going to get massive rubbing all the way under your armpits and inside your legs. And you'll be rubbed red raw in half an hour. You want to strip off and try and get as much of the grit off you as you can. If you don't, the grit in your armpits and groin will make your skin erupt into horrible infections and boils. And if sand clogs up your sweat glands, you could end up with painful prickly heat rash, which is unbearably itchy. Never give yourself any more trouble than you need. Once you've got most of the grit out, quickly get your clothes back on so the sun doesn't see your flesh. Tiny desert springs bubble to the surface. But don't be fooled. This could be lethal quicksand, which has been known to swallow vehicles and people whole. Fall into this and you'd be in big trouble. I'm going to show you how to get out of it alive. And what's nasty about this stuff is the more you fight it, the more it like, pulls you in and let you suddenly realise it. One thing about quicksand is uh, <clears throat> you don't realize you're in it until you're in it. And then once you're in it, you don't realize right away the danger because you think you can get out of it. And then you find that it encompasses you to such a point that it's very difficult to get out of it. If you don't panic, he, as he said there, you can actually get your body on a horizontal position, so to speak, and you'll float. Your body is less, has less uh, buoyancy, has uh, more buoyancy than quicksand does. So you won't drown as long as you don't panic. Now, the problem is that in our theological world, we have a, uh, an idea that has, like quicksand, permeated uh, our thinking in every way. Uh, if, if we go to seminary, if we go to Bible college, uh, somewhere along the line, you're going to adopt a, a Calvinistic idea. You may adopt a whole lot of Calvinism. When I was uh, in seminary, I studied under a professor by the name of S. Lewis Johnson. I had third year Greek with S. Lewis Johnson in my first year of seminary. And we went through the book of Romans, and he taught us in that class principles of Calvinism based on Romans, his interpretation of Romans. And uh, then he wasn't renewed by Dallas because of this five-point position. In the first couple of years of seminary, I was a four-and-a-half-point Calvinist. I actually have said that Calvinist represents the essence of Christianity. And I repented, of course, and God has forgiven me. But that's, that was my position at that time. Uh, it's hard to, it's very easy to get into, especially when you trust your professors, but it's very hard to get out because you have to think yourself. <clears throat> There's a, uh, a definition of quicksand, a bed of soft or loose saturated sand, saturated with water, having considerable depth, yielding under weight and therefore tending to suck down any object resisting, uh, resting on its surface. Uh, the appearance and reality of quicksand, the odd thing about quicksand is that it appears to be solid ground or else you wouldn't walk on it. It looks normal. However, the reality is that only when you step into it do you realize it won't support your weight. And I think many people don't realize that Calvinism doesn't support the weight of the truth of the gospel. It will suck the person in. There's a gal that's just about ready to go under. And uh, that's, a, that's a four and a half point Calvinist right there. My definition of Calvinism, uh, wait, yeah, there it is, a noun, did I do the, yeah, I did the other one, 
a noun, a broad bed of theological suppositions saturated by multiple theological works and teachings having considerable breadth, but no substantial exegetical depth, yielding under the weight of unchallenged theological conclusions and therefore tending to inundate and effectively, effectively trap the Bible student who attempts to wade through the theological swamp. That's my definition of Calvinism as quicksand. Why is it so popular? Again, when I, this message isn't particularly exegetical and it may or may not elicit questions from you, but it's more of a, a look at the Calvinist position on a psychological type basis. Why is it so popular? Uh, because Calvinism has a pithy, easy to remember formula. Oh, did we hand out the, uh, the handouts? Okay. And so you can follow along pretty much what I'm going to say. The handout has, by the way, a little, a very good, I think, summary, which I got from two different places that will put things in historical perspective, which isn't going to be on the slides. Anyway. Why is it popular? Because it's so pithy, a pithy, easy to remember formula, TULIP, who could forget it? Uh, as an acrostic, TULIP gives a person an easy way to remember the scheme and the organization of the beliefs. Uh, total depravity, of course, is, uh, I think we've really worked over total depravity in this conference. We, we've talked about it almost every time, uh, but that is, uh, that's a foregone conclusion by the Calvinist, and it represents the T, of course, and then the unconditional election. This is review, I'm sure. Uh, predestination in some way to salvation. Uh, I'm going to talk about unconditional election uh, in a workshop tomorrow, I think. And uh, we're going to talk about Ephesians 1, 3 through 5 or 6. And the, the diagram is in my book, and I'm going to show you from what I can see exegetically, uh, and I can be corrected if somebody doesn't agree with that or shows me that I'm wrong, but it seems to me when you diagram the sentence of Ephesians 1, 3 to 6 or so, uh, it's not saying anything about election unto eternal life or unto that kind of salvation. Uh, so we'll talk about that. Tomorrow, uh, uh, I'm sorry, tomorrow we'll do that limited atonement, the efficacy or the efficiency or the purpose of Christ's death, and then uh, the I is irresistible grace, the application of new life to the elect sinner, and then the perseverance of the saints. So those are the five. That's the necessity for validation of possessing eternal life. And if you don't validate it, it's like somebody gives you a check and you don't sign it and cash it. You don't have it. It's popular, too, because as a, an acronym, it's a, an acrostic, and as an acronym, it gives a person an identity or a niche in the spectrum of religious beliefs. It identifies what a five-point Calvinist mistakenly believes. I'm a Calvinist. Calvinism is unadulterated Christianity. I, but maybe not thee, are loved by God. A Calvinist can't say God loves you. A Calvinist doesn't know. He can only say, if you're an elect person, God loves you. Now, you try that on your witnessing platform. It sort of goes over like a lead balloon because you can see all kinds of problems that that arises. It's popular because Reformed theology had an honorable beginning. See, we're talking about Reformed theology here, and uh, it started out well. It legitimately opposed the Roman Catholicism's works-based soteriology, essence of salvation. 
the Roman Catholics sold indulgences. Martin Luther said, ah, and pulled his hair out. And he nailed his 95 theses to the Wittenberg door in opposition to the Calvinistic teaching somewhat. John Calvin was 11 years old, I think. Is that right? 1509 to 1517. What is that? Eight years old. When, uh, yeah, math wasn't my basic subject. I don't think. <laughs> so John Calvin comes along in, in uh, France and later on comes up to Switzerland, but he gets hold of this reformed idea that Luther and Zwingli started. So they were fed up with Roman Catholicism, not only on a political basis and the power of Rome and Charles and, and uh, King Charles, but also uh, the Pope's authority over them, selling indulgences so that your people can, your loved ones can get out of purgatory. Martin Luther said, wait a minute. And he started to oppose this idea once he studied the scriptures himself. And that's the key. Number two, it legitimately opposed papal authority in both the spiritual and political arenas. That's fine. That's honorable. People wanted to be free. To be free of Rome meant to be free of the, both the state of Rome or the empire as well as the pope. <clears throat> it legitimately insisted on the right of every believer to have direct access to God. You can't do that in Rome. You've got to go through a uh, Romanism. You have to go through a, a priest to do that. There's a couple of early reformers, and I think that's in your handout too. I like to put pictures in somewhat. It kind of lets us identify. Uh, there were three primary performers or, or uh, reformers. Uh, in history that are usually identified as the leaders of the Reformation. One is uh, uh, Heinrich Zwingli, and there he is on the left in the picture, and then uh, uh, his uh, follower and disciple, uh, Bullinger. Uh, grand old fellows, aren't they? they? I mean, look at that, look at Bullinger. Wouldn't you like to have him as a granddad? I mean, this is great. Uh, Zwingli got killed in a battle uh, against the Roman Catholic uh, forces, the cantons, they call them. And uh, he sort of left the scene a little bit early. Bullinger carried it on. Uh, he differed a little bit from Martin Luther in the, so far as the uh, sacraments go, uh, whether it was a memorial view of the Lord's Supper or otherwise. Uh, in Germany, on the left, we have Martin Luther, and then his primary disciple on the right, Philip Melanchthon. And these are guys you can kind of identify with him. So if I say something about Luther, you'll think of that stern-faced fellow there on the left. And uh, I'm not sure, that's a nice collar. That must be a fur collar on, on Melanchthon. But there he is. And then uh, the other final uh, reformer that stands out mostly is, uh, at the beginning at least, is uh, John Calvin on the left and his uh, primary disciple and person who took over his ministry in Geneva, uh, Theodore Beza. So these, these guys uh, are, are respected individuals. If you take a course uh, in seminary on the Reformation, uh, they did a lot of stuff that opposed the Roman Catholic Church, which was good. <clears throat> I think what happens in theology is that you have a, a basic, the, uh, truthful, biblical position, and you set forth that position, and then as time goes on, and people should be progressing in their understanding, they slip back beyond the original truthful position. In the early days, it was salvation by grace alone, through faith alone. Ask any apostle. And it didn't take long after they left the scene to have questions about whether water baptism, baptism was necessary in order to go to heaven. 
they slip back. They progress, but then they slip back out of, out of the, the grace principle. Uh, jumping ahead a thousand years, the reformers uh, pulled away from the Roman Catholic Church. That's good. And then their disciples came back to the principles of the Roman Catholic Church in, in essence. Now we have to work to validate our salvation. That's very similar to the Roman Catholic position, as uh, Steve had indicated earlier. Uh, it's hard sometimes to distinguish what the reform position is from the Roman Catholic position. Now, you know what happened in, just as an aside, dispensationalism arose. And we had a pretty good idea of what the dispensations were, and people didn't always under, understand them to be seven dispensations, but there's a distinction between Israel and the church and the millennial kingdom. Do you know what has happened in dispensationalism? We've made the point. We've pulled away from the reformers, and guess what we're doing now as dispensationalists? Coming back to the positions. I talked to Ronald Nash one time. He's a reform philosopher, I guess would be better than calling him a theologian. But he says, what do you think about, well, I'll name him, Daryl Bach and Craig Blazing and their progressive dispensationalism in Dallas Seminary? And off the cuff, and I, th I think I'm pretty near right, at least this is the way I perceived it at the time, I said, uh, it seems to me that they're trying to be all millennial without telling anybody. Because progressive dispensationalism puts Jesus on the throne in heaven, on, on David's throne in heaven. David didn't have a throne in heaven. He's prophesied to have a throne on earth. And Jesus is not in charge of the Davidic covenant, uh, the Davidic kingdom now, that, as far as I can tell. And if you have some biblical statement on that, let me know because I'd love to be corrected on that. Well, that's like I say, that's an, an aside. It had an honorable beginning. It's popular because the original reformers, original reformed theology adopted liberating principle. Uh, <laughs> can't speak this evening liberating biblical principles, the priesthood of the believer, for instance. Intervention is required in the Roman Catholic Church, but it's not required when you separate yourself and become free from the Roman Catholic Church. They said every believer has a right to pray to God. Now, I don't know whether they would say every unbeliever has a right to pray for him or not, but at least the believer could access God directly through the great high priest, the Lord Jesus. The authority of Scripture as well. The interpretation by the Roman Catholic clergy is not required under this reform system, but direct access to God's truth through His Word is available. That's good. So see, these are liberating biblical principles. Now my suggestion to you is that Reformed theology has slipped back into Roman Catholicism. The third one is that uh, justification is by faith alone. And as somebody has written, faith alone, really alone. You, know, you get it? It's like the Bible is verb, is uh, inerrant, really inerrant with no mixture of error, really inerrant. Justification by faith in loan, indulgences aren't required. Immediate forgiveness and acceptance by God is available through the gospel and the gospel offer. It's popular because Calvinist terminology and definitions have been accepted as standard fare. You know that whoever defines the terms has the at least 
uh, upper hand in the argument. That's what they seem to be doing. Now, here's some terms that I got, and I don't know that I, oh, no, this is not it. Here's what we have to ask. When we have the term elect, we have to ask, elect under what? What does that mean? Does that mean, does that mean that you and your wife were predetermined by God to be married? Did he choose you for both for each other? What do you think about that? I, I'm, I have my kind of doubts about that. I know this one, the one that you're with, you better stay with. <laughs> because you chose her, or you chose him, mutually, I suppose. But we have to ask a lesson in what? Chosen for what? Predestined for what? We have to ask questions. Depravity? What does that mean? Calling. If effectual calling. Common grace. I don't know that I have any recollection of that term in the scriptures, common grace. But that's a theological term that people have come up with to express their position. Uh, efficient or efficacious grace is another one. Where is that found in the Bible? Well, those are distinctions made because the system requires distinctions. Prevenient grace, that's the Arminian or the Methodist, uh, John Wesley type Methodist uh, idea, the old fashioned believing Methodist. You know. uh, that's not in the Bible. The grace that God extends you so that you can believe and I always wonder what's the difference. If you can believe, and then you come along and you can't believe, but God lets you believe, so what? I, I don't see a, a shade of difference in there. Okay. We'll try again. More. There we go. What did I put here? I went too far. <clears throat> Why does Calvinism prevail? Calvinism sticks. It's like throwing mud at the wall. Yeah. Calvinism sticks because tulips are easy to remember. Philosophically, Calvinism sticks because tulip provides an identity, a psychological identity in inclusion, a peer group, if you will, camaraderie, a sense of belonging. That's nice, isn't it? Does that make you warm and fuzzy? But you get a bunch of Calvinists together and they just love each other. <laughs> There's a real camaraderie between them, just like there is of all people with similar beliefs. And so this gives them a place in the world. Historically, Calvinism assumed the honorable beginning in its attempt to reform the Roman Catholic Church. Developmentally, Calvinist con concepts have been embedded into theological discussions and literature so as to become a false face of what is considered orthodox. They claim to be orthodox. Orthodox being right. In your handout, I've given you the pictures again so that you can they're not exactly suitable for framing, but uh, <laughs> they'll, they'll remind you of who we're talking about. Uh, after that in your handout, and I've put, uh, from these men grew and developed a system of theology that expanded and developed notably from 1517 when Luther nailed he, his 95 theses to the door, the Castle Church in Wittenberg, Germany to the formation and publication of the Westminster Confession in 1646, more than 100 years later, 130. This development can be summarized thus, and what I've done is take, taken you and given you some events that have occurred as Calvinism progressed and uh, became a popular subject. And you can see that, as we were told, I think, in one of the uh, 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 
what do you call it? Speak, uh, speak, uh, huh? Sessions. That's it. In one of the sessions, you know, it goes after a while. That, uh, what, what was I talking about? What did I start to say? <laughs> Calvinism branched out from Geneva for some years through their disciples and expanded all over Europe and into England. And that's what, that's kind of a summary of, of that instance. And then I'll conclude, like quicksand, Calvinism is difficult to escape. It provides a comfort, and this may be repetitious, you've got a comfortable identity. Because the identity with Calvinism generates unrealized pride. You don't always realize it when you're proud. Because Calvinism seeks to be a reasonable and logical system of faith. And it is very logical as long as you don't bring the Bible into it. <laughs> but you know, logic never got anybody to heaven that I'm aware of. Because we're given the impression that the only other alternative is to follow Arminius, Calvin's enemy, or Pelagius, Augustine's enemy. And that's the only, you either have to be a Calvinist or you have to be an Arminian. And if you're an Arminian, you're just as low on the earth as you can be to a Calvinist. Calvinism is difficult to escape. Fifthly, because if you reject Calvinism, you're considered anti-intellectual and a heretic. Now, who wants to be that? See? Because there's little published support for any other biblical alternatives. Folks are simply not aware of the free grace movement. Many folks are, aren't. And if they are aware of the free grace movement, if they have Calvinistic underpinnings, you are, we, let's say, we are heretics and infidels and anti-intellectual. We're as stupid as a rock. <laughs> That's the way they look at us. And all we say is, well, gee, let's go to the scriptures. Now I put this, like quicksand, you saw the guy when he got out of the mud, the quicksand, it must be washed away once it is intellectually rejected. And by that I mean you'll have all kinds of baggage if you're a Calvinist. And once you understand that Calvinism is a system of soteriology or salvation that isn't supported by the Bible, not one twit of the five points of Calvinism is biblical, nor do they have any support for it. That's what I tried to do and think I did all right in the book that's published out there. <clears throat> and we're just about done. A sense of contamination must be acknowledged. You know you're dirty before you clean up. The inundation of Calvinism creates theological baggage or traditions that must be jettisoned. Oops, too far once more. A process of cleansing must be deliberate. And I put the recognition of each assumption must be squarely compared to what the words of the scripture actually say. That's, you know what that is? It, well, it's two things, it's difficult and it's honest. And if you're lazy or if you're dishonest, you'll never come to a free grace position. Only after cleansing can there be an application of the fragrance of God's free grace. Only then can there be a full appreciation of His love, His gracious attributes, His kindness, 
and satisfaction toward all mankind because of Jesus providing that satisfaction and the privilege of serving him in his magnificent cause. Any questions? Thank you. Do I have any questions from the floor or from the internet? Number two, you, the, the third line says, I, but maybe not thee, are loved by God. <laughs> How does a Calvinist know he's loved by God? He does it until he dies and see if he perseveres because he's never sure that he's loved by God or that he has eternal life until that moment. And then it's a little late. The, uh, I never have gotten a, a, an adequate answer to that from a Calvinist. It, it, the rejoinder from them seems to be that, well, God is working in my life to bring me to uh, serve him more, love him more, and serve others. And before, I wasn't doing that. Now I'm doing that. Mm -hmm. And that's how they know well, that they're loved by God. That's, where, they're, God that's where they them. get... Okay. The question is, did that pick up? Okay. All right. The question is, does Calvinism inspire service by that means? Well, you can, you can be inspired by service by legalism or fear of hell. And if that makes you a little bit more assured, then you can glean a little warmth out of that. Uh, I'm inspired to serve the Lord as, as inefficient as I am to do that, not at all by the fear of going to hell, but one of these days having him say, well done, good and faithful servant, that's the most, that statement is going to be the most important statement, statement from the lips of Jesus when you are in his presence. You see, one of us will have an audience with Jesus one day. Every one of us will have an audience, us, all by himself, all by himself. You know, everybody falls all over themselves to get an audience with the Pope, <laughs> don't they? I mean, you can't hardly go, you can't talk to Pope. You got to go through a lot of, <clears throat> one of these days we're going to speak with Jesus and he's going to say that. I sure hope he says it. He may not say it at all because I might be a total failure in my life. So I think, I'm not sure if that really follows your question or not. Well, it, not really. It, it, it's... There's a subjectivism. They they make out like there's a uh, that, yeah. that that's a very logical system, but there is a subjectivism there that. Yeah. Um, well, you answered me, the question. <laughs> yeah, there's yeah. there's got to be a yeah. subjectivism that it, that they're not aware of, and I don't think we hammer on that enough. The yeah. subjectivity of. It's the, like the that guy says that says. Uh, after he talks about himself for an hour, he says, that's all right, that, that's enough of what I, that's enough of, of about me, what do you think about me? All right? <clears throat> it's not what I think about me. That's not the issue. It's what does God think about me. I had one guy, now here's, here, let me illustrate this with a practical statement. One guy in our old church, in our church now actually, he's left, told me, well, first of all, he wanted me to celebrate Calvin's birthday, 500-year birthday back in 09, I think it was. And I said, yeah, I'll celebrate his birthday. Bring out the candles, you know. <laughs> but but he, was a, 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 he, he had been a Reformed Baptist and a very five-pointer. And I, I said, well, you know, I talked to him. Jesus died for everybody. Oh, gee, what do you mean? How could you even believe that? I said, well, how do you know that you're going to go to heaven then? He said, uh, I was told the answer to that one time. He said, uh, how do I know that I'm going to go to heaven? My obedience. 
Yeah. Huh? Right. Think about that now. Did he say anything about Jesus? No, he said, my obedience. He wants to think about me. I, I think one other big problem that we have is that all the standard commentaries are Calvinistic. Yeah. Okay. Oh, and, yeah. and the if, if you have a typical evangelical household, if they have one commentary at all, they've got Matthew Henry. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which is Matthew Henry was a Calvinist. Yeah. And that that's part of the problem that we have. Big commentaries. Linsky was a Lutheran. Several volumes thick. Uh, Calvinist perspective. John Calvin wrote a bunch of commentaries. People love those. What, he, what I'm saying is, is we don't have standard commentaries. Well, we do. It's just, one's out on the table out there. You know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. I, do, I We don't have a plethora of commentaries. Well, that's a problem. See, that's that's one of the reasons that Calvinism is popular is because that's all people feed on. If you feed a cow grass, he's gonna his meat is gonna taste different than if you feed him oats or hay with supplements. <laughs> if if all our Bible college students have to feed on is assigned text and Ten different commentaries on the Book of Jude, let's say, and they're all Calvinist. They write their papers. They're going to quote the commentary. They're going to believe what they quote. It's a problem. That's that's one of the things I wanted to kind of make tonight. Okay. Any anything else? Yes. <clears throat> My hiking partner here. We made it. <laughs> and didn't. We made the it. The most important part is we didn't die. Which is kind of fun. Yeah, um, yeah. I noticed uh, <laughs> this happened a couple times um, about five to six years ago. I noticed this happened in several. Uh, it just happened to be young ladies, and I don't know if it is uh, uh, something that appeals more to women or, or not. But I noticed several several girls go from being uh, either Catholic or completely atheistic to evangelical to Calvinist, not based upon necessarily the the whole of the tulip, but especially the election idea and how it leads to the idea of a total systemic sovereignty of God, mm -hmm. they seem to be drawn to the idea that they were puppets almost. You know, they, they weren't hardly responsible for their own actions. They, yeah. God was running everything, and that gave them this, this almost cult-like following obsession with uh, the principles of Calvinism because it, it seemed to, to rev, uh, free them from their worries and their obsessions. And they're like, it's God's now. I don't have to worry about anything. It's all, he's marked my steps. I'm his little robot. And that was, that was such a, and I just, do you have well, comments on that idea? What you said there is, uh, in essence, the Calvinist did, the Calvinist desire not to be responsible, but to put all responsibility for salvation, whether it be this person or that person, on God. And ultimately, that absolves us, if we're Calvinists, as the responsibility to go into the world. Now, I know they have their, I know they have their basis for it. They think that there's an elect group of people, and if they obey God, and go forth into the mission field or witness or what have you, that uh, God will save those elect pe people. Uh, but they don't just give it to anybody. It's only the, they know in their minds the only people that are going to ever believe are the elect ones. And that's their duty is to take the word to the elect, not to everybody. But they don't know who the elect are, so they got to tell everybody. But they can't tell everybody that God loves them because they're not sure that God loves them. And so, if they're honest, and I mentioned this before, if uh, John Piper, for instance, on his website, and I mentioned this the other night, uh, advises Calvinists to talk like Arminians, to give the gospel just like you would if you were an Arminian. But is that honest? Does he really believe that 
they can believe in God. They don't. 